Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. We're going down the personal collection rabbit hole again today. This is a Les Paul KM. It is one of the earliest 59 reissues that Gibson tried to do, and oh my goodness, they did an awful job. So, keep in mind, for this whole review and demo, it's more so about comparing it to the Les Paul standard specs of this era, versus what this thing is. And this thing is a beautiful, natural, first-run example of the Les Paul KM. So what does this thing got going for it? The biggest thing in comparison to regular Les Paul standards of the era is the fact that it has a two-piece maple top. That was kind of unheard of in the Norland era. Most of them are three-piece plus. So to have a matched two-piece center seam that was rare. That's pretty much the only 59 spec that they've got going on here. Now, keep in mind, there were other Kalamazoo produced instruments that would occasionally get two piece tops. You can find some really beautiful Les Paul customs that get two piece flame tops, but they're rare. They are not the normal. So that is one of the biggest things right there. However, the most characteristic KM spec has to be the double cream T-top pickups. So these kind of cause the kerfuffle with the Marzio who now owns the patent on double creams. So this is the only guitar, and I can say that with about 99.9% .9 confidence, the only double cream T-top guitar to exist. Stock from the factory, uncovered anyways. I mean, you might be able to take a cover off of one and maybe find it, but there's other models out there. Like there's a special model 335 and a couple of other ones like the GK55 in the early 80s that do have the same double cream exposed pickups, but they're dirty fingers. They're not T-tops. So if you ever see double cream T-tops, you know they came out of a KM at one point in time if they're for sale separately. So next up, for cool specs on the KM, it comes down to their inlays. So normally Les Paul standards, they get trapezoid inlays, right? And that's exactly what this has. But standards have acrylic. They're essentially fancy looking plastic. The KM's got real deal mother of pearl. So if you ever see a KM and you go, huh, those inlays are strangely white. It's because of that. They have real mother of pearl inlay. I remember when I first found this model, I never put two and two together. I just knew that these were strangely bright colored. As far as the headstock, they got a special Les Paul KM truss rod cover right here. I mean, that's a special spec, but not all that special. They've got the big old Norland era headstock, so that's not very 59 spec. They've got a volute. It's a three piece maple neck. Yeah, that's not 59 spec, but they do have a one piece body, but to be honest, that's not an identifying fact of a KM because most guitars birthed in the late 70s do. They just have a one piece back. I mean, we're kind of getting out of the era where they were doing that pancake body. You can find some all the way until 1979, but generally that starts to phase out around 76, 77. Another spec that they got wrong on these things is they have the big thick binding in the cutaway, not the thin one that's the historic spec. So all in all, absolute failure of a 59 reissue but we're in the you know the right direction getting towards where we need to be i mean the strings and things guitars being produced at the exact same time as these were way better so you can see why that place was like selling bootlegs of them and whatnot before getting a cease and desist and then gibson really ramping it up in the early 80s before the prehistoric les paul reissue era starts in about 1983 outside of custom orders and whatnot so the only other story we need to talk about today is this, a custom made plaque. There's rumor to be about 1500 of these things in existence. I don't personally trust that number. It's just a number that gets thrown around a lot. I suppose that could be a shipping ledger number, but I've never personally seen it. But the first run examples came with this on it. It says custom made. I believe they actually just came in the case so you can actually find them installed in different locations. Most of them are down here. I have seen one where somebody put it on the backside of the headstock. So that's what makes me believe that maybe not all of them came installed from the factory that way. But as a collector, I'm always looking for the ones that have the plaque. I'll pay a bigger premium for one that has a plaque versus one that doesn't. It might be kind of ugly on there. It's definitely an acquired taste, but it makes it highly collectible. And if you're a really hardcore collector, there's three different finishes to collect on this model. You've got the natural, you've got kind of a brown sunburst color, and then a very vibrant cherry sunburst. 
Now, I swear this year I saw a black one show up, but I could not find that listing again. It's possible it was a refinish or it was just a custom ordered one off type thing. So always take internet advice, you know, with a little bit of grain of salt. If they say there's only three finishes, you know, there, there could be a few outliers within the data pool. So those are the three main finishes anyways. But now my own personal story with this guitar. I bought this last year, I think almost a year ago. It was around December. And one of the most famous guys for using a Les Paul KM is YouTuber Robert Baker. He uses it in all of his. And ironically, I bought this thinking of him, but I didn't realize I had purchased it from his local shop. It's like, why did they not tell him about it? So there was a point where I was going to sell this to him, but it's not in perfect shape. It's got wear and tear. It's relatively clean, all things considered. It's a natural example, which is the hardest finish to find of the KMs. But I wanted to document a natural one on my channel, and then it just ended up staying with me. I've also documented a few others on the show, including Robert's actual guitar. So you can check those out here. So to learn more about this particular example, let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench, take an individual look at its parts and specs, and then get to that playing demo. Inside the Les Paul KM, I've torn apart quite a few of these, but I've noticed something I've never noticed before on this, so we'll get to that in a minute. First, let's take a look at our T-tops here. So why are they called T-tops? It's because they have T's on the tops of the bobbins. It was to help the workers know which way they should go, was the original reasoning behind that, but they just look like this. Sometimes they'll have ink stamps on the back, sometimes they don't. It really just depends when they were made. Usually in 79 you would have it, but this one does not have it. So that means they were either worn off or they just never got stamped anyways, but you can see the patent number base plate right here. As far as our neck pickup cavity, you can see the mahogany body in here with the maple top, but I'm not seeing any special markings. It is kind of cool though seeing that mahogany body after the top is all natural. It's a cool color combination. Now unfortunately, the bridge pickup, this screw is so stripped out I can't get it. A viewer of the show did send me a Dremel. Unfortunately, I don't have it with me today, so I'll, that'll be another day when I have to tear that thing out. Sometimes you can get away like turning the pickup ring around if you take the pickup out of the ring. So I was gonna try that, but then, oh no, our other height adjustment screw is also stripped beyond belief. <laughs> so trust me, it's original. Y you've got the T's on the bobbins as it should have. And it's pretty much just the same thing as in the neck pickup. And I have personally seen the underside of it. It's exactly what it should be. It's just really hard to show you on camera without breaking the ring. But within the circuit, these pickups should read around seven and a half. So 7.63K ohms in our bridge position, neck, right where it should be 7.57, no worries there. 3.8 in the middle just for fun. And here's a pro tip on your toggle switch. If you ever put it in a position and then wait and it automatically switch back like that, it's because the bottom of the skirt is actually preventing it from going all the way into position. So in order to fix that, you just need to loosen it a tad and you should be good. Like loosen it and then tighten it down to where you feel like that ridge starts to begin. So. This one has to be a little bit left loose to stay in position. I remember the first time I ran into that situation, I was so frustrated. The switch is broken, the switch is broken. No, you just gotta loosen a little bit. Now the bridge on this example is absolutely filthy. This guy had some very corrosive sweat. I, I really don't think anybody even messed with those screws right here. It's just to sweat ate them. And that's very apparent by this bridge. It's probably time to replace this. It's looking pretty rough and thankfully it is very easy to get a Schaller made in Germany bridge for one of these things. They're not that expensive because they put them on pretty much everything. But this is what I never realized on a Les Paul KM before. So Sustain Sisters normally refers to this. For the bridge they get a large brass block but this has something very similar for the tailpiece which normally got paired with the sustain sisters and you can tell that because it has that little rubber bit around it so these actually have upgraded tailpiece studs and i never realized that before until this one what drew my attention to those is if you look around here you see how the finish is slightly discolored and orange it's ever so slightly but it's because of that rubber it reacts with the nitro and i remember seeing that on a natural 2550th anniversary last Paul and going oh man that's quite a shame every single one of those is gonna have that so now I saw it on that that's another spec that I did not know about on the Les Paul KM so thank you for watching this video if you've watched the other ones because you never know what you're gonna find on these things
But here's that custom made plaque. They used these back in the 50s and 60s to cover over the pre drilled stop bar tailpiece studs on like 335s, etc. That got like a Bigsby on it. It's a conversion type thing. So they put custom made over it to make it look fancy and get away with hiding those studs. But for these, apparently it was just done as a limited edition nature status type thing. As far as the knobs, regular volumes and tones, these feel kind of stiff to use. I don't know if the electronics need cleaned out or it's just been a while since I've had a Norlin Airy guitar. They're not quite as fast as modern day ones. And here's our pick guard. It's got the same corrosive sweat, maybe even another stripped out screw. I'm not sure. But let's take a second to appreciate this top. I love the wood grain on it. It's got specklings of scratches, nicks and dings, which I'm not a big fan of, but it's got a bunch of bird's eye in it as well. You'll see that more in the B-roll shots than here, but you can really get a look at all that beautiful wood grain. You can find KMs with flame tops. I have not seen one show up for sale publicly in about five years though. I'm talking spectacularly flame tops. Most of them are pretty plain. So a, a bird's eye natural maple one. Yeah, I'm, I'm all right with that. That was a pretty nice find. But it would be nice to have at least one of the colors in like spectacularly flame top. But around that custom made plaque, you can tell that one was likely installed by the factory by the placement location and the fact that this is what the finish originally looked like from the factory. You can see it's definitely yellowed quite a bit. That's a two-piece maple top with a solid mahogany body. Weight relief didn't begin till 82. But now we've got that maple neck with the rosewood fretboard. This is just regular rosewood. It's not Brazilian. Sometimes you get guys going, oh yeah, it's Brazilian. Other times you'll get people saying the Les Paul KM was the last Les Paul made in the Kalamazoo plant. That's just internet rumor that was not well researched at all. If you want to know the very last Les Paul custom made in the Kalamazoo plant, check out this video right here. It was the last one ever done. It had a special note on it. They made Les Pauls all the way up until the day that they closed in 1984. Kalamazoo made Les Pauls do start to become increasingly more rare in the 80s though, especially for just regular standard productions. And that's when you'll find the two piece tops and stuff like that. But we've got 22 low wide frets on these with once again, the mother of pearl inlays. Now this thing, despite the top being relatively clean, it was played so much. You've got some fingernail divoting in this area right here. That's a little bit deep. That's pretty deep right here and there. And you can tell there's quite considerable fret wear, especially on that second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Now pretty much in this area of the neck, it's really worn down. So maybe a heavy rhythm or solo we kind of guy in this territory. Not so much up here. I like it when a guitar can tell a story. I'd probably put this on the list of, yeah, probably needs a level recrown, but I won't bother filling those in. They don't really affect play. But as far as our nut width, 1.67 inches, kind of skinny. And then by the 12th, gets really wide, 2.06. First fret neck depth, 0.81 and then 0.98 by the 12th. Here's what that looks like at the first and 12th fret. Definitely a pretty rounded looking neck, C-shaped. Despite what the measurements may make you believe, it's not a huge neck by any means. It definitely gets a little bit chunkier up here, but it's a very wide kind of thin, but has a little bit of a bump to it as a C-shaped neck. Do want to take a second to talk about these inlays on the side. A good way to identify a Kalamazoo made instrument versus a Nashville one in the era when they're using like decal serial numbers and you can't just tell by looking at the last three digits, look to the side marker inlays. Shine a light on them. If you see a slight red reflection or something that looks like this, that's how you know it's a Kalamazoo build because they use tortoise shell inlay on the side. Now I don't think it's real tortoise shell and the side markers are also larger on the Kalamazoo ones and a little bit more spaced apart at the 12th fret, but that's something you can use to help identify it. Because usually at least one of them will have some sort of a reflection there that you can see. Moving on now to the face of the headstock. It's got lots of scratches and whatnot. I'll have to tighten up those tuners, but at least the lacquer is actually in pretty decent shape on this. It hasn't yellowed over too much. Truss rod is in perfect shape. Very important to check your maple necks for twists. It just happens to a lot of them, but that's what our truss rod cover looks like. Les Paul KM. What does KM stand for? I've always been taught Kalamazoo, you know, Kalamazoo. 
However, in my other videos, it's been commented, it probably actually means Kalamazoo, Michigan, because there's dots after it. So although together, Kalamazoo doesn't make sense. So Kalamazoo, Michigan is what it officially means. You want more proof of corrosive sweat? Look what he did to the tuners. <laughs> That's just from tuning that darn G-string all the time, front and back. It's the only tuner that's bad. Moving on to the backside. Very clean electronics on this one. Absolutely never been touched. Very minimal solder work. Normally you see more than that, but it has never been touched. Pot code state to 1979 looks like the 24th week. They're all pretty legible. And of course, this has the shielding tin over top of it. Not a 50 spec either, but that's how they shielded your electronics. And how they also grounded them off, instead of using a traditional ground wire to the tailpiece stud. And then over here, we've got our toggle switch. Everything's looking nice there. So the condition of the back. It looks pretty darn good. Like when you get it in the light, you can see some light buckle worming marks, nothing too crazy, some dings. This is really the worst spot on the entire guitar, I would say. The guy's strap just mutilated this thing. But how clean the rest of the guitar is, you know, relatively speaking, this guy took the utmost care of this thing with how much he played it. It's amazing that it's in as good of shape as it is in, and it looks great now that I've polished it up too. But far from the usual near mint condition example, that I normally collect. But this one kind of falls under the terms of beggars can't be choosers. Not all of them have the custom made plaque and how many of them are available in natural that have really nice looking tops that are in good shape. You kind of have to take what you can get and you know, just go from there. But three piece maple neck on this guy, a little bit of figuring, nothing too crazy, but the back, impeccable shape, I really, don't think I see hardly any dings or anything like that. Maybe a few small ones. Now with the back of our headstock, I guess the last lesson I can teach you guys if you're new to the 70s, 80s era, once Nashville opens the doors in 75 and you get into this style of serial number in 1977, outside of the decal years, you can tell if your guitar was made in Nashville or Kalamazoo by looking at the Made in USA stamp. If it's stamped vertically, it's Kalamazoo made. If it's stamped horizontally, it's Nashville. That does not apply to before 1975 though. They kind of had to change that. You can also look at your serial number if after 77 when they adopted the current day style. If it's 499 or less, it's Kalamazoo. Anything over that, it's a Nashville made product. But as I was telling you earlier, you know, b before this serial number came out, sometimes it can be hard to tell which factor years came out of from 75 to early 77. But you've got a few bumps at the top and like some sort of like a, a white residue. I was unsuccessful in cleaning most of that off. The black light test is real easy on this one. It's such an old guitar. I don't have to get it right next to the light to be able to see it glow. Everything's glowing a lot. So knobs exactly as we should see, plastics all look correct. Sometimes the pickup rings will glow, sometimes they don't. Don't be too alarmed if you're looking over your own instrument and only the neck glows and the bridge doesn't. Sometimes that's just how it is. This example, both of them do. But our headstock is a great even ghastly green color. Back of the guitar, same as the front. You can see a couple of those scratches, nicks and dings a little bit more clearly like this. And of course that strap button wear area. But our neck is looking good. The color difference in the glowing here is caused by being a maple neck versus mahogany. The lighter colored wood makes the color over this look a little bit different, just as in regular lighting situations. This one doesn't really have too much in the category of stand rash either. In fact, I don't see any on that side. I mean, if it wasn't for that strap, it probably wouldn't even have any major finish wear. The last spec to capture is the weight. They're usually always pretty heavy, around 10 pounds. 10 pounds, four ounces in this case. All right, let's go ahead and plug it in and hear how this one sounds. All right, let's go ahead and go through the tones of this. What's the very first thing I notice when playing this thing? It's very stiff, and I kind of remember that on some other KMs as well. So if you're wanting to do like big bends, honestly, it's not that comfortable on this guitar. Now you could top wrap it and adjust your setup, but now I'm starting to realize why the fretware was in this area for this thing. It's a extra glassy sounding Les Paul. I mean, listen to this. I 
almost feel like you need a Bigsby on this thing to even make that even more shimmery. That was just the middle position. Try that same lick on the neck. <laughs> Now the bridge. neck and middle position for me on this guitar. If I knew some more jazzy chords, I feel like this guitar would pull that off really well. that neck pickup is way louder and beefier. I mean, I guess I could lower it down since the bridge pickup is already about as high as it really should be going to balance that out, but I think that's just what makes this example fantastic. <laughs> Let's go ahead and try some distortion. these humbuckers almost strat single coil like they're that neck pickup especially normally it's the bridge that steals the show I mean it's good right <laughs> Everything is articulate and clear, but the neck pickup almost has that angry strat tone to it. Not not quite, it's still full and humbucker-like, but I think you can kind of hear that in the lead. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about right there.
now that we know all about the Les Paul KM, what are my final thoughts on this thing? I don't really like playing this guitar that much, but I love the tones that are coming out of it. It definitely needs some sort of a setup, I think, or maybe that's just how this one is. Somebody enjoyed it quite a lot just the way it was. Bending on this guitar is really difficult. Playing in the upper registers, it kind of almost frets out the way that it's currently set up. So yeah, it might need some relief put in the neck. It might need to raise the action just a tad, but after you do that, I'm sure it'd be great for a regular player. So is a Les Paul KM for everybody? No, not really. Especially now that the collector's market's kind of taken over on them. You used to be able to pick these things up around like 2,500 to 3,000. Those days are long gone. Any more people are asking, you know, five to 10 grand, depending on, you know, the condition specs and all that. But it is a very rare piece of Gibson history here. Well, maybe not very rare, but it's nice to find one in good shape that has the custom made plaque in the natural finish with some nice wood grain. So if you love the look and you like that it's collectible, yeah, go ahead and find yourself one. Otherwise, just get yourself a regular Norlin era Les Paul standard and you're getting very similar specs as far as the wood construction. I mean, yeah, you're going to have an additional piece of wood on the top and you won't have the cream uncovered T-tops, but you'll have very similar specs besides, you know, what well, we talked about what made this one special. So troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed learning about the Les Paul KM today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care. As always, if you're interested in being the next owner of one of these demo guitars, you can check them out on my website, troglysguitarshow.com. There's some links in the description.